invite you to take your Bibles with me this evening and look in Matthew chapter 9, please, if you would. Matthew chapter 9. Boy, what a wonderful job, choir. That was great. Didn't you enjoy that? Boy, I tell you, it was good. Wouldn't it be something to get to heaven and you just get to listen to people like the woman at the well and the blind man and countless others that experience what Jesus could do? And we meet such a one here in Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew 9, we'll, we'll just read the first eight verses here of Matthew chapter 9 for our scripture reading here this evening. And another miracle that Jesus did to a lame man. And let's, yeah, I know you just sat down, but let's stand together to read the scripture, all right? All of us standing, we'll read God's word together and we'll read the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 1, then I'll read verse 2, we'll alternate until we end with verse number 8. And let's begin on verse 1 of Matthew chapter 9. Ready? And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. And read eight together with me also. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Now, Father, we thank you for this evening and thank you already, Lord, for what we have heard, the tremendous music and the testimonies and the great songs. And, Lord, we have been blessed. And yet, Father, we desire to hear from you through your word this evening. And so as we take just a few moments and look into your word tonight, I pray you'd minister to our hearts. Holy Spirit of God, speak to us tonight. Accomplish what you would like to accomplish in each and every heart of each individual that's here this evening. Lord, no one's in this room by an accident. You knew exactly who would be here. You know exactly what they need. And I pray you'd meet that need tonight. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Matthew is an interesting book, and it's talking a lot about the person of Jesus Christ. In the first four chapters of Matthew, you find out about the person of Christ. You read about the virgin birth, you read a little bit about his childhood, his baptism, and his temptation. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the, what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's the longest recorded sermon of Jesus in the Bible. And we learn the principles by which Jesus expects His followers to live by. Okay, So we find the person of Christ, the principles of Christ. But beginning in Matthew 8 and in the Matthew chapter 9, we see the power of Jesus Christ. In these two chapters alone, if you'll read them and study them, and we won't go into all of it tonight, you'll see ten different miracles that Jesus performs. And uh, we're just going to look at one of those miracles uh, here this evening. I won't keep you very long tonight. And we're going to see the power of Jesus Christ. You'll find out as you read through these miracles that Jesus had power over demons. Jesus had power over disasters. Jesus had power over disease. And he had power over death. Jesus has power. He has all power given unto him. So he comes to a city called Capernaum. And there's a man brought to him who's been lame. He's paralyzed. And he has some friends bring him to get healed by Jesus. And I just want you to notice three things about the miracle that takes place here in Matthew chapter 9. The first thing I want you to see is the pardon that this man receives. Notice in verse 1, he entered into a ship, passed over, came into his own city, 
And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, this man's crippled. He cannot get to Jesus on his own. Most, uh, that's the way, by the way, that's the way every lost person is. You can't get there on your own. You need someone to help you. And that, like the, the, the eunuch who was traveling in his chariot reading the Gospel of Isaiah. And, and Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I accept some man guide me? Somebody show me who he's talking about. And here, this, this man is helped by four different men. Uh, it doesn't say four men in this passage, but in the parallel passage over in the Gospel of Mark, we find a little more detail. And it says he had four friends. And I think it took four ingredients to get the man to Jesus. I think, number one, it took faith. It took faith. In fact, Jesus said he saw their faith when he said to the sick of the palsy. The faith comes not only on the part of the lost one who needs to put their faith in Jesus Christ, but it comes on our part that we have to have faith enough that if we get someone to Jesus Christ, He can save them. If we just get them to Jesus. Listen, you're not just trying to get them to church. You're not just trying to get them to some religion. You're not just trying to get them to live a better life. You're trying to get them to Jesus Christ. He is the one that changes lives. He's the one that can work the transformation in their heart. There's not salvation in any other. He's the only name. And there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And get him to Jesus. We have to have faith. Someone said that, that, that you've got to believe that Jesus can help them. And they were absolutely convinced Jesus would help this man. And so they took, doesn't say how far they traveled. Doesn't say how difficult it was. I don't know how far they walked with each guy Probably on a stretcher, I, I think of a stretcher with four guys, you know, two on each end, and they're carrying this fella, and, and they're going to get him to where Jesus is. That's faith. But then I see also the second ingredient, and that's love. That's love. They love their friend, and they didn't want to see him in this condition. They didn't want to see him go through life paralyzed and unable to get around and to enjoy life. And they said, boy, if we can uh, just get him to Jesus, things could change. His life could change. When you love someone, you want what's best for them. How can you love someone and know they're lost without Jesus Christ and not try to tell them about Jesus? You say, oh, they'll get mad at me. Well, wouldn't you rather have them mad at you now? then look at you pleadingly on Judgment Day and say, why didn't you ever tell me? Why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? You knew all the time and you held back? Our excuse will be pretty flimsy when we say, I didn't think you'd listen. Oh, you don't know what God will do in someone's heart. Love, love is the willing, sacrificial giving for the benefit of someone else. Willingly, sacrificially getting them to Jesus Christ for their benefit with no thought of return. I don't care what they think of me. I want to tell them about Jesus and what He can do in their life. It takes love. It takes a love for Jesus Christ and a love for people. So they had to have faith. They had to have love. They had to have determination. I don't know how long they talked about helping their friend, but one day they decided to do something about it. I'm sure they discussed it many times. And finally, Jesus was coming to Capernaum, and they said, fellas, we've got to quit talking. It's time to do something. And let's get him to Jesus. Let's, let's be determined to get him there. Let, let's make this thing happen. And, and the thing is, when they got to where Jesus was, there was such a crowd, they couldn't get close. And, and the, the great thing about it is, their determination was, they didn't say, hey, well, we gave it a shot. Well, we tried. Oh, well. Let's just go back home. No, no, no. You know what they did? They decided to go up the steps on the side of the house, up on the roof of the house, and they began to tear the roof up. They said, we're going to get this guy in. Now, don't you think anybody said, hey, you're cutting. You're cutting in line. Hey, 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 the, line, the line's back here. Huh? Ever been in those situations, huh? No, 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 no. Where do you think you're going? You know what? They ignored everybody. They were determined to get that person to Jesus. And so they went up and they put a hole in the roof to lower him down through the roof. I, that's determination, my friend. 
not taking no for an answer. I see faith, I see love, I see determination. I also see cooperation. Took four of them to get this fellow there. Took four of them working together. You know, oftentimes we're, we're quick to take credit when we get to lead someone to Christ and say, well, I had this many saved or I had this many. But you know what we don't know? Is how many folks witnessed it in before we got there. How many folks were praying, have been praying for them to come to know Christ. And we think it's, it's, it might not be on our account at all. We got to pick the fruit off the tree. But you don't know who made that fruit ripe, ready to be picked. And uh, the folks, it takes cooperation. All four of these men working together, uh, everybody grab an end and, and let's carry this guy. And, and we'll get him to Jesus. And it takes cooperation to get him there. So this man was sick and had, uh, the, the Bible seems to indicate, in his case, his sickness, what wasn't, it, Jesus didn't deal with that right away. He dealt with his sin first. Now, not all sickness is because of sin. Okay, don't, don't get the idea that anytime you get sick, there's sin in your life. That's not what the Bible teaches. But here, Jesus, and by the way, Jesus oftentimes took care of people's physical needs before he met their spiritual needs. And that's nothing wrong with that. But make it a, the, the reason you want to minister to them. But you understand, we can't just treat people's physical need and ignore their spiritual need. You can't just clean up the outside if you never change the inside. One of the things that we're dealing with with the prisons and the prison ministry is they're realizing that uh, the, the recidivism rate, is that word right? Is Bob up here? Bob's gone. Is the recidivism, I say that right? Uh, the, the repeat offenders. And, and they're just there again and again and again. They say, oh, I'm never coming back here. And guess what they do? They come back here. And, and they're saying they understand that because we don't reach the heart, if you don't change their heart, you won't change their behavior. It'll just come back and repeat itself. And so it, it's got to get to the heart of the matter. And listen, man has all kinds of answers for the outside, and man has all kinds of answers for the physical, but they're not meeting the root of the problem, which is a spiritual problem. And at the root of many problems is a sin problem. And Jesus goes to the root of the problem. And, and the problem oftentimes is not our outward behavior, that's just the symptom. It's our inward condition that's the real problem. The inward condition of sin. And for that reason, you don't need reformation. You need transformation. You need to be transformed by Jesus Christ. And you don't, you don't need a new leaf. You need a whole new tree. Okay? You need Jesus Christ. You need a whole new life. And that's only possible by receiving the pardon from Jesus Christ for your sin. And the way... Listen... The way you get your pardon from Jesus Christ is to believe He died on that cross for you. He died on the cross for your sin. We spoke about that forgiveness of sin this morning on the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't, don't just, when you go to the doctor, you don't just want Him to treat your symptoms. You want Him to treat your problem and get to the root of the matter and, and allow Him to rub out your sin. A little boy had been bad. The family had a little chalkboard by the phone where they wrote messages. He got into trouble one day and so he wrote on that board by the phone, Dear Mommy, please forgive me. If so, please rub this out. He was so relieved when he came back a little bit later and his mother had erased it clean. You know what? If you come to Jesus Christ and you ask Him to forgive your sin, He'll rub them out. But He rubs them out with His blood that He shed on the cross of Calvary. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So I see pardon, but I see something else here in this miracle of healing the lame man, and that is power, the power of Jesus Christ. Notice verse 3. When Jesus said in verse 2, Be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Behold, certain of the scribes within, said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath, what church? Power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. 
They're murmuring and complaining in their heart, but Jesus knew what they were thinking. He said, ah, who can forgive sins and but God only? This man's blaspheming. They're right. Only God can forgive sins, and that's exactly who was forgiving sin. Because Jesus was God. And He is God. You have to... They didn't believe that Jesus was God come in the flesh. You understand, you, you don't become a Christian by believing in God. Jesus put it this way to His followers. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in Me. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to believe that He is the Son of God and that He is the Savior and that He has the power to forgive sin. You have to make a decision about who Jesus Christ is. And there is no middle ground. Nobody is undecided about Jesus. You either are for Him or you are against Him. There's no middle ground. And if you have not received Him, then you have rejected Him. Make no mistake about it. And you don't want to die having rejected Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting how the Bible makes it clear here that God can read our mind. God knows your thoughts. Satan does not know your thoughts. Don't, don't think, don't get caught up thinking that there's this epic struggle between these two powers, you know, Satan and God, good and evil. There's no such thing. God is omnipotent. What does that word mean? He's all-powerful. Satan is a created being of God. He's, it's, it's like um, the, uh, me taking on Samuel up here, little Sammy. Okay? I would, I would sit down and squash him. Okay? I mean, it, it did no, no contest. There's no, there's no contest. God is all powerful. He is, and He knows our thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. That's why, by the way, it's vital that when you get a negative thought, you don't have to verbalize that. Once you verbalize that, the enemy hears it. And now he knows it and he'll use it against you. But the devil's not reading your mind, he doesn't have that ability. God knows our thoughts. God knows what we're thinking. Only He can read our mind. It's amazing to me how often the world wants someone to read their mind or tell their future or what it's going to be. We have psychics and mind readers and all kinds of things. One sign reader had their sign out front of their place. Mad Madam Zonga sees all, hears all, tells all. And then the sign said, honk so I'll know you're here. Figure that out. <laughs> Hebrews 4 and verse 13, the Bible says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto him with whom we have to do. So you come to God and you're here tonight and you have burdens and you have concerns and you have heartaches and you're hoping maybe nobody notices, you're hoping maybe nobody knows anything, but I'll guarantee you this, God knows God sees what's on your heart tonight. God knows what's inside that you don't maybe want anybody else to know. God knows what's there. God sees every single need. And He's waiting. Listen, when you're here tonight and if you're not saved and you never trusted Christ and maybe you're a little afraid because you think, well, everybody thinks I am saved. Maybe, maybe I, I've been one of those who know about Jesus, but I don't know Jesus. And boy, if I come up and say, I, I don't think I'm really saved, I need to know Jesus. Everybody, what are they going to think of me? Listen, God knows. Don't worry about what other people think. Worry about what God knows. God already knows about it, and He's waiting for you to admit it. He's waiting for you to agree with Him about it. And admit it to Him that He, what he already knows. Don't. When the invitation's given, sometimes people are hesitant to come and use the altar. They wonder about who's watching them. I'm more concerned about the fact that God's watching me. And God is waiting for me to respond to Him. It doesn't matter uh, who's going to be there, who's not going to be there. It'll be, listen, it'll be a whole lot more embarrassing on Judgment Day if I do not do what God wants me to and I stand before others and before Him on Judgment Day and have to give an account for the things I've done. 
whether they be good or bad. Jesus forgives this man's sins and he tells him to take up his bed and walk. Tells him to go on home. And you know, we can't see when Jesus forgives somebody of their sins. You can see it when He heals a blind man and He walks. But somebody says, well, if I just could see a miracle, then I'd believe in Jesus. Well, I could just take you around the room tonight on a little tour and show you some miracles that are right in this room this evening. Joy-filled lives that have been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. There's many, <coughs> excuse me, there's many things in the Bible you might find to argue about. But it's hard to argue with the power of a changed life. And there's many changed lives in this room here. A little girl who'd been praying for her father to get saved, finally he did. She went around telling everybody, My daddy got saved! My daddy got saved! An atheist in town heard her saying it one day. And he told her, oh, little girl, that's just a fairy tale. There's no such thing as being saved. She looked at him and replied, Sir, I don't think it's a fairy tale. But if you think it is, please don't tell my daddy. Because since he got saved, he don't come home drunk anymore. Since he got saved, he don't beat up mommy anymore. Since he got saved, I don't have to hide in the closet anymore. Daddy, don't waste money on beer anymore. Sir, if it's not true, don't tell my daddy. If you don't believe in Jesus, you can't explain the miracles that I see in this room. The lives that have been transformed by Jesus Christ. Liars who've been made truthful. Drunkards who've been made sober. Promiscuous who've been made pure. Selfish tightwads who've been made generous. Self-centered people who've been made servants of God. Those who've been addicted to drugs and other things who are now addicted to Jesus Christ. We're not all we ought to be, but praise God, we're not what we used to be. How do you explain that? I could, I could take time. I think there'd be a miracle in every road that I go down. It's amazing what God has done. Charles Bradlaugh was an outstanding atheist in England. Down in the slums was a minister by the name of Hugh Price Hughes. Hugh Hughes. All London was aware of the miracles of grace that were accomplished at his mission. Charles Bradlaugh, the atheist, challenged Mr. Hughes to a debate on the validity of the claims of Christianity. The challenge perked up the ears of all of London. What would Hughes do? He immediately accepted debate, but in doing so, he added one challenge of his own. Hughes said to Bradlaugh, the atheist, I propose to you that we each bring some concrete evidences of the validity of our belief in the form of men and women who've been redeemed from the lives of sin and shame by the influence of our teaching. I will bring a hundred such men and women, and I challenge you to do the same. Mr. Bradlaugh wasn't so sure he wanted to accept that. He said, Mr. You said, if you cannot bring a hundred, Mr. Bradlaw, to match my hundred, I'll be satisfied if you bring fifty such men and women who'll stand up and testify they've been lifted up from the life of shame by the influence of your teaching. You can't bring fifty? Will you bring twenty? Twenty people who will say, as my hundred will, that they have great joy in a life of self-respect as a result of your atheistic teachings? If you can't bring 20, I'll be satisfied if you bring 10. Can you bring 10? M Mr. Bradlaw, can you bring just one? One man or one woman who will make such a testimony regarding the uplifting message of your atheistic teaching. Mr. Bradlaw withdrew his challenge to debate Mr. Hughes. That's the power of the gospel. 
It is hard to speak against the power of a changed life. I see the pardon of Christ. I see the power of Christ. And then notice what happened after the man. In verse number 7, he arose and departed to his house. Notice verse 8. When the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. I see the praise that went to Jesus. Someone said, when, this, when Jesus healed this man who had come down through the roof, uh, the praise went up through the roof. And uh, that's exactly what took place. When you look at the pardon and the power of Jesus, and, and by the way, when you look at the pardon of Jesus in your life and the power of Christ in your life to live a life victorious over sin and to give us the promise, as we talked this morning, of eternal life forever with Him in heaven, how can we not give Him praise? How can we not praise God for His goodness to each one of us? I'm excited about what God's doing at Bible Baptist Church. It's exciting to see that. One thing that will take that away is not praising Him for what He does. Not praising Him for what He's doing. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 150. Would you look there with me please? Psalm 150. The very last psalm. The very last psalm. Notice the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. I, I got the idea God may want us to praise Him. Listen carefully. Your heart beats around 100,000 times each day. Your body has about six quarts of blood. That six quarts of blood circulates through the body three times every minute. In one day, your blood will travel about 12,000 miles. That's four times across the United States from coast to coast. When's the last time you thank God for one of your heartbeats? You take approximately 23,000 breaths every day. The process of inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide is a complica complicated respiratory task that requires physiological precision. We tend to thank God for things that take our breath away. But when's the last time you thank God for the breath you take? Your kidneys are bean-shaped organs, each about the size of your fist. They're located in the middle of your back, just below your rib cage, unless, of course, you've had a transplant. Then they're not there. They're actually in the front. They are really sophisticated trash collectors. Every day your kidneys process about 200 quarts of blood to sift out about two quarts of waste products and extra water. The waste and extra water become urine, which flow to your bladder. Your bladder stores the urine until you go to the restroom. When's the last time you went to the bathroom and just thank God your plumbing was still working? Your eyelids blink about 10,000 times each day. We have to blink to cleanse and moisten the eye. Each time your eyelid closes, salty secretions from the tear glands are swept over the surface of the eye, flushing away small dust particles and lubricating the exposed portion of the eyeball. Our eyes are always forming tears. The blink wipes them away and protects and cleans the eye. When's the last time you thank God for one of those cleanings? You have roughly 1.6 trillion skin cells. Humans shed about 600,000 particles of skin every hour. About 1.5 pounds per year. By 70 years of age, an average person will have lost 105 pounds of skin. Sadly, we put on more than that. It's not the best weight loss plan. 
Humans shed and regrow outer skin cells about every 27 days. You'll grow almost a thousand new skins in a lifetime. When's the last time you thank God for the protection your skin gives you and continues to give you on a day in and day out basis? I hesitate to use this one, but I will. The average human mouth produces about two liters of spit every day. Our salivary glands, which are located on the inside of each cheek, at the bottom of the mouth and under the jaw at the front of the mouth, churn out two to four pints of spit every day. Saliva contains many important substances, including electrolytes and mucus and antibacterial compounds and various enzymes. Saliva keeps your mouth moist and comfortable, helps you chew, taste, and swallow. It fights germs in your mouth and prevents bad breath. It also has proteins and minerals to protect tooth enamel and prevent tooth decay and gum disease. When's the last time you thanked God when you smelled or saw something good to eat and your mouth began to water? See, giving thanks should be as natural as all our ways. Listen, how can, you, how can someone know the human body and think we just evolved? We are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's the most complex machine that's ever been developed, the human body. We ought to praise God for it. The more we find to praise Him. You know, at a conference at a Presbyterian church, people were given helium-filled balloons and told to release them at some point in the service when they felt like expressing joy in their heart. Not, not all Presbyterians, but, but most Presbyterians are a little more quiet, uh, reserved, shall we say, a little more formal maybe. And, and so they, they, they didn't feel free to shout hallelujah or praise the Lord like you can in the Baptist church. Thank you. So all through the service at different times, different balloons would be let go and they'd go floating up in the church. But when the service was over, they were amazed to see that over one-third of the balloons had never been released. Can I urge you tonight? Let your balloon go. There ought to be times when it just comes up inside of you and you just want to praise God. And just rejoice and praise Him for His goodness to you. Praise Him for His pardon. Praise Him for His power in your life. And praise Him for the miracle that you've seen Him do in you. Let's pray together. Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. If it were not for Him, we would be of all men most miserable. We'd have nothing not only to live for, we'd have nothing to live with, we'd have nothing to look forward to. Our hope is in Jesus. Thank you for His pardon in our life. Thank you for His power in our life. Help us to give you the praise that you deserve for the miracle you've done in our lives. And Lord, my prayer tonight would be if you've never done that miracle in the life of someone here tonight, that April 1, 2018 would be the day they would give testimony that Jesus did a miracle for them. And He pardoned them from their sin. And He gave them the gift of eternal life. 